As far as 9-11 is concerned, what is most important for you to understand is the concept of a law of nature. A law of nature cannot be violated, a law of nature cannot be changed, a law of nature requires no enforcement. But Galileo's law of free fall, for example, the rate at which bodies in free fall fall toward the center of the earth, that's not something that can be violated. There's a formula for elementary physics students know d equals one half, uh, one half gt squared. It's a very simple principle and it cannot be violated. And in the case of 9-11, we find that the government's position could only be true if you could violate a half a dozen or more laws of nature. I mean, it's that simple. And if we want to assign a value to phenomena, the, the, the occurrence of which requires a violation of laws of nature, zero isn't small enough. Because if you assign a probability of zero to some event, that suggests, well, it might occur, but it occurs incredibly infrequently. Actually, in the case of laws of nature, since they cannot be violated at all, the value would have to be like null. So it can't just be zero, but zero with a bar through it, meaning this is impossible. Violations of laws of nature are physically impossible. And yet the government's official scenario is replete with violations of laws of nature, as I am going to explain. Now, if you want more sources on 9-11, and more of them are becoming available a daily as more and more uh, students of the case, including many highly qualified scholars, including physicists, persons who in terms of their background with the physical sciences is far greater than my own as a philosopher of science, where I have a great interest in scientific reasoning and critical thinking and logic and logical theory. Okay, what we need is the merge, you see, of the patterns of reasoning applied to the physical data to yield the result that the government is trying to sell us a bill of goods here that's not even physically possible. The, the best introductory works on this are by a fellow named David Ray Griffin, uh, The New Pearl Harbor, a wonderful summation of the evidence, and his book, The 9-11 Commission Report, Omissions and Distortions. And I will uh, let you know that there's a new book that will be out in the spring entitled 9-11 uh, and the American Empire, which is co-edited by Dav David Ray Griffin and by Peter Dale Scott, who is one of the most celebrated and accomplished of all JFK scholars. He's a professor emeritus from Berkeley. And I am very uh, honored that the first essay that will appear in that collection edited by, by Griffin and Scott is one that I have authored entitled uh, Thinking About Conspiracy Theories, The Case for 9-11. So I'm going to give you a, a distillation of what, what I have turned up and what others have independently turned up, including now most recently a physics professor from BYU who's not known to be a raving lunatic uh, about the pure physics of the case because the laws of physics and of material science and of structural engineering indicate that this is an impossible scenario that we have been asked to believe. So you have to consider now, we've got two kinds of conspiracy, right? You've got these 19 hijackers, um, si near simultaneously hijacking these four planes and flying them into the Twin Towers and the Pentagon, and versus a more extensive conspiracy that involved cup culpability of a kind that, that, as in the case of JFK, leads directly into powerful figures in the administration. I mean, it's uh, almost impossible to see how you can account for what really happened without going that way. But I don't want to presume, I want to present the evidence and for you to understand and sort it out for yourself and then I'll be glad to take your questions. Now, the key issues to consider are going to be the, the, the rate at which these buildings fell, the temperature at which steel melts, the order in which the buildings fell, and uh, the force that would have been required to turn concrete into a fine powder. Those are some of the key issues that I'm going to address. These two buildings were some of the most remarkable structures uh, in, in engineering history. They were two 110-story buildings. They were extremely well constructed, and they were designed, as I will explain, to withstand the impact of aircraft collisions, even multiple aircraft collisions. Many people even today don't realize that the first impact on the North Tower, which is distinguished by having the antenna, it has an antenna, so you can tell the North Tower, which is World Trade Center 1 from the South Tower, World Trade Center 2, was actually count on film. Uh, 
There was a French team in Manhattan that was filming and they happened to capture the impact. You can't see it terribly clearly here, but the actual footage they shot is available. And I would add too that there are a couple of video clips that you want to look at, one of which I'm going to show a part of here today. One is called uh, In Plain Sight, P-L-A-N-E-S-I-T-E. That's available from the Power Hour through the internet. And the one I'm going to give you a clip from is entitled Loose Change, which may be the best one yet. So you're going to actually see the buildings come down and be able to make judgments uh, on your own. Now, the, the North Tower was hit by American Airlines Flight 11, which took off from Logan Airport. It was a 767, about 758, and it was in the air for about 50 minutes when it impacted with the 96th floor of the North Tower at 8.46 a.m. Much more attention was being devoted to the, to the Twin Towers at this point in time, so there's a lot of footage of the impact with the uh, South Tower. Here we see uh, the plane approaching the South Tower as the North Tower is in flames. Here's the plane coming forward. This was United 175, also out of Boston's Logan Airport, another 767. It took off at 814 and impacted with the 80th floor at about 903. Interestingly, its amount of time in flight was about almost identical with that of a flight, Air, Air, uh, American Airlines 11, about 50 minutes in the air. Here's this tremendous impact and the explosion and the fireball. And what you want to appreciate is that a tremendous amount of the fuel that was aboard the aircraft was burned off in these fireballs within the first minute or two. A tremendous amount of the fuel that was aboard the aircraft was burned off. So the amount that remained was not so extensive. It turns out, it turns out that uh, steel has a melting point of 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The steel used in these buildings was certified by Underwriters Laboratory for to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit for up to six hours. Six hours. The highest temperature at which kerosene can, uh, based uh, jet fuel can burn under optimal conditions is around 1,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Underwriters Laboratory actually estimated that because of the insulation and so forth in the building that it was far more likely that the steel itself was never heated much above around 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which of course is obviously far too low to accommodate the melting of the steel. The, the highest temperatures that were measured in the South Tower were around 1300 degrees Fahrenheit, but still way, way below what would have been required. Now what's interesting about the fall of the buildings is the order in which they fell. The, uh, the uh, South Tower uh, fell at uh, 10 a.m., actually 9.59, after only 56 minutes from impact. So it was only 15 mi 56 minutes of exposure at temperatures that were far too low to actually melt steel before the building came down. The North Tower, however, was exposed for an hour and 37 minutes. So it's very curious that the building which was exposed to these, uh, these fires, which are uh, alleged to be the cause of the collapse of the building, fell in the wrong order. They fell in the wrong order. If it was actually the heat from the fires that is supposed to precipitate their falling, then the North Tower, which was hit first, should have fallen first. But it was the South Tower, which was hit second, that fell first. There are many indications of the nature of the collapse that are rather stunning. There's a tremendous amount of uh, steel girders that are thrown outwards. You can see a lot of them here in the dust and debris cloud. The way in which the buildings fell was quite stunning because they fell into their own footprint. This is rather remarkable on several counts, considering that vastly more damage would have been done to lower Manhattan if these 110-story buildings had fallen somehow askew and onto other buildings. They not only fell into their own fit footprint, but they fell s in such a way that uh, most of the steel was in 30-foot segments, which made it very easy to load aboard uh, vehicles, and most of the steel was in fact very promptly removed by an extremely efficient company by the name of controlled demolition. Now here's further indication of what's going on, and it is stunning how the, the massive concrete, there's a huge quantity of concrete here, was pulverized, turned into very fine powder. Now if these buildings had come down as the government contends, by virtue of this pancake effect, there should have been a tremendous pile of residue of concrete, concrete chunks concrete boulders and all that. No such was found. In fact, this concrete was turned into very fine dust, which required a tremendous amount of greater, greater amount of explosives than the energy that would have been released by the pancaking effect of the building. Moreover, and this is quite stunning too, the rate at which the buildings fell 
is perhaps most remarkable. I mentioned Galileo's law of free fall. If you had dropped, say, a, uh, a billiard ball from the top of the World Trade Center, 110 floors up there, it would have taken eight to 10 seconds to hit the ground, encountering no resistance whatsoever. There is no scenario for a pancake effect of buildings falling that allows them to fall at the rate of free fall. If you were just to surmise, hypothetically as an approximation, that they would take a second for each floor to collapse, and if you were talking about the whole 110 floors, that would represent 110 seconds or 100 seconds too many. If you assume that, well, yeah, but the one hit on the 96th floor, so we're only talking about collapse from the 96th floor, that would still be 96 seconds if you're assuming a second per collapse per floor. Now, an engineer in California suggested that a second is too high, that it may have only taken a half a second in order for the, the mass, uh, the, the weight of the upper floors to overcome the resistance of the lower floors and suggest that a half a second. Well, if you take a half a second into 96 floors, then you get 40, 48 seconds it should have taken for the building to fell. Yet they only fell in eight to 10 seconds, far too fast. Similarly, the hitting the 80th floor of the uh, uh, other uh, trade uh, tower uh, would have required 40 seconds if you uh, at a half a second per floor. Far too fast for the eight to se 10 seconds that they fell. I mean, it's not even physically possible that the buildings could have fallen in accordance with the government's claim. Moreover, now, although it doesn't show it here, but in other footage that you'll find on the video clips that I mentioned, there was a tremendous explosion in the sub-basements. These sub-basements run seven and eight floors below the ground. There was tremendous explosion in the sub-basements that was even recorded on seismographs run by Columbia University about eight or nine seconds before the building started to fall. About eight or nine seconds, that is to say, before the planes impacted with the buildings. The tremendous explosions in the sub-basement. I mean, it's really dramatic stuff. And we have some workers who were there that were damaged by these sub-basement explosions and talk about a 50-ton hydraulic press, for example, that was completely obliterated in the explosion. And if you look at the film footage of the explosions, you find all over the place, there's these little plumes of smoke breaking out called spools that are symptomatic of a controlled demolition. Here's a spool. See how it extends. Here's another. See how it extends. Here's another. See how it extends. And we wound up with this, this mass of steel that was uh, surprisingly easy to remove because so much of it was of a relatively uniform size around around 30 foot lengths, really quite remarkable. And they started cleaning up the site almost immediately. Now the claim was made, and you can find this in the 9-11 Commission report, that the center of the buildings was all hollowed out. But the only part of the center of the buildings was all hollowed out were the actual elevator shafts. There were in fact 40 seven steel columns at the center of each of these buildings. 47 steel columns at the center of these buildings, and on the perimeter, there were no less than 240 steel columns. And you certainly would have expected them to be projecting upward if the building had fallen. It would have been very asymmetrical. It would have been very different kind of collapse than occurred here. Here's uh, some early photographs in the construction of these buildings. They were really marvels of engineering. These were brilliantly conceived buildings, and they were built in the full knowledge that it might be the case that they have to resist the impact of aircraft. Here is a Frank Martini, who was the chief engineer on one of the towers, who reported that they were constructed in such a fashion and they were so resilient that the impact of the largest known commercial aircraft at the time, a Boeing 707, would be like sticking a pencil through mosquito netting. And I found three other engineers who played primary roles in the project who say the same thing. This guy, Frank Martini, was killed on 9-11 when the buildings collapsed. Here's a comparison of the Boeing 707 with the 767. They're very similar in their dimensions, in their maximum takeoff weight, maximum fuel capacity, cruise speeds, and the like. These are very similar aircraft. Let me mention, by the way, that this is the first and only time in history that any steel structure skyscrapers are ever collapsed due to fire. It has never before been recorded in the history of structural engineering before or since. So government is asking us to believe that on this one day, 9-11, as it were, the laws of physics were suspended and phenomena never before known to structural engineering were taking place just in this exact location. Here is World Trade Center building number seven. This was a 47-story 
skyscraper, which if it hadn't been surrounded by 110-story buildings would have been regarded as quite a substantial uh, building. This building fell at 5.25 p.m., never having been hit by any aircraft and only having sustained two relatively small fires. And it was brought down by what we know was a controlled demolition because uh, Larry Silverstein, who had leased the World Trade Center about six months before all these events took place and insured the buildings at uh, quite a substantial chunk of money in the billions of dollars, for which he then collected twice by insisting it was two different attacks, had a conversation with uh, somebody he described as the chief of police, where Silverstein reported, he told the chief, well, there's been so much death and destruction, maybe the best thing we can do is pull it where the term pulling, of course, in construction means take it down by controlled demolition. This building came down perfectly symmetrical, fell into its own footprint, absolutely crystal clear that that is what happened to World Trade Center 7. The best that the 9-11 uh, Commission could do was to say that the only scenario they had for its collapse was highly improbable. What that means is they couldn't explain it. What that means is if they did explain it, it would raise too many important questions about whether the other buildings whose collapse was so very similar to the collapse of World Trade Center number seven hadn't been from similar causes. In this case, notice, in order to pull the building, there had to be pre-positioned explosives. The building could not have been pulled unless there were pre-positioned explosives, which raises the very appropriate question, does that mean there could have been pre-positioned explosives in the World Trade Center? Well, there have been a lot of reports of oddities involving security in the weeks leading up to 9-11. The, the agency, the responsible for its security is a company named Securicom, a director of the agency, which not only was responsible for security at the World Trade Center, but also at Dulles Airport and for United Airlines, was none other than Marvin Bush, the president's brother. Well, what about what's going on down in Washington, right? Okay, so what's going on in uh, New York was physically impossible, can't possibly be true. What about what's going down in the Pentagon? Well, if you look at some photographs of the damage to the Pentagon, well, it looks kind of reasonable that uh, 757 maybe could have caused that kind of damage. Here's another close-up. Uh, well, it looks kind of plausible. Maybe that's the way it went down. Uh, here's a hole in the third ring inside the Pentagon where, they, where it came out. Now, the existence of this punch hole, and look how symmetrical it is, raises a lot of very interesting questions. The nose cone of a Boeing 757 is just loaded with fragile electronics. There is no way in which the nose of a 757 could have punched through the third ring of the Pentagon, where these, each of these rings is, is a reinforced, you know, concrete reinforced steel. There's no way that could have been uh, caused by the nose of a 757. On the other hand, and this has led to some speculation, it certainly is the kind of damage that could have been caused by a cruise missile, a Tomahawk cruise missile with a depleted uranium nose cone, for example, which has raised the question of whether the building could have been hit by a cruise missile instead. And indeed, there are witnesses who said that it looked just like a cruise missile with wings. And I say, nothing looks more like a cruise missile with wings than a cruise missile with wings. So that, that's a hypothesis that has to be taken seriously. Now look at the lawn. There were multiple reports about how the 757 entered the Pentagon. Some say it just sort of skimmed over the lawn. But in a moment, you're going to find how utterly implausible that is. Others say, well, the wing touched down the ground and it dug up the, you know, and it cartwheeled into the Pentagon. Others say it crashed into the lawn and then skidded into the Pentagon. But you'll see here and in other slides that the Pentagon's surface, the grass, is perfectly smooth. Here, in fact, now is a photograph of the actual hit point before the upper floors collapsed. The upper floors did not collapse for a half an hour after the original hit. This opening is approximately 10 feet high, 10 feet high, and 16 to 18 feet wide. I've often described it as about the size of the double doors on a mansion. Now, look at all the things around here. You've got plenty of windows all over the place that are, aren't even damaged. There are no signs. There are no signs of a Boeing 757. There's no fuselage. There is no wings. There is no tail. There are no seats. There is no luggage. There's no bodies. Now, uh, you've heard of the airlines losing your luggage, right? But this is ridiculous. It should be strewn all over the place. It is not there. It is not there. 
Here's another photograph comparing the two. You even got a car in the foreground. This Boeing 757 has a wingspan of 125 feet. It has a tail that stands 44 feet above the ground. There are no indications whatsoever that a Boeing 757 ever hit the Pentagon. Number of indications that a Boeing 757 hit the Pentagon? Zero. None. Nada. Nothing. Such that a French student of this case who wrote two of the earliest books on it, one entitled Pentagate, the other 9-11, The Big Lie, uh, Kerry Myerson, Thierry Myerson, uh, had his son create a website to show a photographic record uh, of, of just the kinds of evidence I'm talking about, which is entitled Hunt the Boeing. And he's saying, look at all the photographic evidence and tell me, tell me, tell me where you find any evidence of Boeing 757 hit the Pentagon. In fact, when the fire department first showed up, you know, they were being interviewed afterwards, and then and the fire chief was asked, well, did you see signs of the plane? And he said, well, or actually, uh, no. He said they didn't actually see any signs of the plane <laughs> inside the Pentagon. Well, that's stupefying. That certainly is impossible if a Boeing 757 had actually hit the Pentagon. I mean, here's an approximate indication of the size of that plane in relation to the ground. Notice, you see, it would have had to skim the ground. I mean, that's an, a remarkable feat of flying. The, 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 the alleged Arab pilot, uh, who, who is supposed to have flown this plane, was described by his instructors as being completely incapable of flying. He couldn't fly. Well, this is a very phenomenal feat of flying. A very phenomenal feat of flying. And, as I say, it's one also that's completely unsubstantiated by the obvious physical evidence. And here, the kind of scientific reasoning I I I that's required is relatively elementary. It's got to do with dimensions. It's got to do with how large a thing can go into how small an opening. And, and, and this is a point that women seem to understand a whole lot better than men. But it's very simple and straightforward. Here's the grass. Look at how gorgeous that grass is. It's virtually like a putting surface. Virtually like a putting surface. No indications whatsoever of any plane having damaged that lawn in any way, shape, or form. Here is a study now of the actual damage done internal to that first floor of the Pentagon. The damage, in terms of taking out the key supports, on the first floor is far too limited to have been caused by a Boeing 757. However, it is consistent with possibly a cruise missile or even more likely perhaps a small jet. And in fact, the air traffic controllers, one of the, t t one of the witnesses to this was viewing the whole uh, flight, uh, the so-called attack on the Pentagon, watching the air traffic patterns, and she said she and everyone else, all the experienced air traffic controllers who were watching this, were sure it was a, a military fighter jet because of its maneuverability. There was a very intricate pattern involved here in coming down and hitting the Pentagon at just this location. One of the fascinating features about the location, by the way, is that this wing was just completing renovation. It had been under renovation for several years. It was the one wing of the Pentagon where if you wanted to cause the least damage, you would want to strike. The Secretary of Defense office, for example, is on precisely the opposite end of the Pentagon. Because it was just completing renovation, it was bereft of files, bereft of personnel, you could have hit the Pentagon, any other wing of the Pentagon, and caused more damage than occurred in this instance. Now, the Pentagon is not a vulnerable building. It's probably the most highly defended building in the world. There are known to be all kinds of anti-aircraft batteries that surround it. There are all kinds of photographs and films. Cameras are constantly taking security photographs. And the question becomes, why were none of those activated? If you assume an hypothesis I'm going to pursue, that it was, in fact, a military plane that was emitting a friendly transponder, then that could account for why the anti-aircraft defenses were never activated. Well, is there any evidence for that? Here are four of the only frames that were released by the Pentagon from a, from a uh, service station across the street from the Pentagon. As in another case we're going to talk about, the FBI were Johnny on the spot. They showed up to take this film within 15 minutes of the strike on the Pentagon where the service station owner hadn't even had a chance to review it himself. So the Pentagon has all this footage that it could easily release if it were so inclined, but which it has refused to do. There's one frame and only one frame that seems to show an aircraft or the semblance of an aircraft. In the meanwhile, there were these two gentlemen in suits who were out putting around pieces of fuselage here and there, uh, one of which actually was photographed, as Jack White observed, and you can find in a PowerPoint presentation he has on my website, 
uh, observed this was photographed in several different positions, and yet it cannot have come from a Boeing 757. This fuselage, this piece, just doesn't fit. You know, you can move it all around on, on the plane, and you won't find a place where it fits on a 757. And it appears to have been planted. Here's a, here's a group of, uh, you know, military guys taking a big a box that's covered with tarps, concealing something. What do you imagine is concealing? I would surmise it's probably concealing something that would have put to the lie to the government's official story. No single part may be more important than this. This is a component of an engine. This is the only component of an engine that was found in the Pentagon. This engine component is too small to be from a Boeing 757. It's, it's, it's also too large, however, to be from a cruise missile. It turns out that this component, however, fits the engine that is used in the A3 Sky Warrior, which is a slightly antiquated jet fighter. Now, it just so happens that several of these A3 Sky Warriors were being, being uh, overhauled at a, a small airport near Fort Collins, Colorado, where they, the, the, the contractors were brought in in teams, so none of them knew the work the other contractors were doing with them. They put in a new uh, guidance, uh, a remote control guidance system on the thing, the new missile components on the thing, a whole lot of sophisticated equipment leading those who were working on this thing and sort of observing what was going on to suspect that this was not just for target practice. Here's a silhouette of an A3 Sky Warrior. If you look here in the corner, we find here, this is where there is some silhouette of an aircraft. And if you impose that silhouette on the photograph, it just happens to correspond to that of an A3 Sky Warrior. And interestingly, there's uh, an, an ejection tract here that could very well be from a missile being fired by the plane just as it's about to impact with the Pentagon to make, of course, the damage that much more substantial. Here is an explosion that was going off. When Jack first put this up in his PowerPoint presentation, he thought it was somebody who just happened to be on the spot when the plane initially hit the Pentagon. But notice you can see all the flames, all the smoke. Obviously, this isn't the initial explosion. What we have here is the explosion that brought down the top floors. So that's very interesting. This is like 30 minutes after the initial impact. And remember, that initial opening is only 10 feet by maybe 16 to 18. Much too small to accommodate anything like a Boeing 757, but the sort of thing you might well expect if it had been hit by, for example, an A3 Sky Warrior. Interestingly enough, although the lawn is completely unperturbed, the Secretary of Defense had the whole lawn chewed up and completely resurfaced. And I suggest that that would have the effect if someone goes to visit the Pentagon and they hadn't, weren't familiar with photographs that were taken at the time of the attack, they might very well infer that, my goodness, there must have been tremendous damage when that uh, commercial airliner hit the ground and they had to redo the whole, the whole lawn, except the whole lawn was perfectly smooth as a putting surface. So why was that done? Here's another example. Look at that lawn. Now, I know the Pentagon, you know, pay $3,500 for a toilet seat and $1,200 for a ranch, but you'd wonder why are they resurfacing a perfectly good lawn? Clearly, they had a purpose. There was a reason. Now, I haven't talked about Pennsylvania. This, uh, the flight, by the way, 77 was out of Dulles. It flew out at 820. It was in the air about a uh, an hour and 20 minutes before it impacted with the Pentagon at 940. United 93. Well, it flew out of Newark. It was another 757. It took off at 842 and went down over Pennsylvania around 120 uh, after an hour and 20 minutes in the air at about 10 a.m., actually 958. Now, because I do a lot of radio talk shows and, and you know, I'm, I'm looking at a lot of these cases, people have heard of me and I had calls and letters from residents of Pennsylvania in the vicinity of where the plane went down and they were telling me how they explained to the FBI that there had been an explosion in the air before the plane hit the ground, but the FBI would not even write it down. Others were saying how they had sheriffs who were taking them to an area outside the officially circumscribed area of the crash, telling them they were going out there to look for, for fuselage parts and body parts in, into this much broader area, but if anyone, you know, if they ever told anyone that they were doing this, the sheriffs would deny that, that it ever happened. I have a, a good friend here in Duluth, recently moved to Rochester, who is an inspector general for the Air Force, meaning he used to conduct or be responsible for investigations 
of uh, airplane crashes for the Air Force. And he told me that the area that should have been covered by the by the, the debris of the aircraft, if it crashed, would be about one city block. In fact, the debris is scattered over eight square miles, which is consistent with the plane having been shot down in the air. And it turns out that that is, or appears to be, exactly what happened. Uh, it, he, he, here's the scenario, because uh, a very famous Air National Guard group known as the Happy Hooligans, who are based in Fargo, were transferred to Langley. So they were actually in the immediate vicinity of the White House when 9-11 was going down. Listen to this scenario. At precisely 9.38 hours, an alarm was sounded at Langley Air Force Base, and those who were on call drinking coffee were scrambled. Thus, the 119th Fighter Wing was off for an intercept. They, the happy hooligans, a unit of three F-16 aircraft, were ordered to head toward Pennsylvania. At 9.57, they spotted their target. After confirmation orders were received, a Major Rick Gibney fired two Sidewinder missiles at the aircraft and destroyed it in mid-flight at precisely 9.58. He was awarded a medal from the governor one year later for his heroic actions, as well as decorated by Congress on uh, September 13, 2001. The happy hooligans were previously stationed in North Dakota and moved to Langley Air Force Base some months before 9-11 occurred on a temporary assignment. And there's a photograph of Major Rick Gibney, who shot down United 93. Now, we heard a lot from the likes of Condoleezza Rice and others that no one had ever thought of using uh, aircraft as missiles or as weapons. Well, this is uh, from a simulation of the Pentagon that occurred a, a year before 9-11 that puts the lie to that claim. I mean, there's a lot of other evidence. This is just one I was able to turn up relatively rapidly by doing a Google search, okay? So here you have the Secretary of State who is either massively ignorant or deliberately lying to the American people about something that was actually well known to be a threat. If you read, for example, the, uh, the, the David Ray Griffin's the 9-11 Commission Report Omissions and Distortions, you're going to find there was a great deal of knowledge that this was a genuine threat that was being dis discounted or disregarded or otherwise ignored or otherwise suppressed by the administration, which raises, of course, the crucial question, why? Was it incompetence? Or was it culpability? Here, finally, is a routing of the various flights. And the, and, the, and the reason I want to demonstrate this is not just that United 93 went down in Pennsylvania. That much we know. What's interesting about this is that Flight 77 went off the radar screen in the vicinity of the Kentucky-Ohio border. This whole dotted path is an hypothetical or imaginary path that the plane may have taken, but it wasn't recorded on radar. And my belief is, in fact, the plane actually went down in the Kentucky, Ohio vicinity. The bodies may very well have been then transported to Washington where they could undergo forensic analysis and identification based on DNA or otherwise. And uh, uh, the plane, probably an, uh, an A-13 Sky Warrior, was substituted here very close to Washington, D.C. Something you may not know, but this is testimony that was given to the 9-11 Commission report by Norman Mineta who was our Secretary of Transportation, was that he was in an underground bunker where Vice President Cheney was in control. The morning of 9-11, not just one, not just two, but three different training operations were being enacted involving NORAD, the FAA, violations or suspension of all the standard procedures to simulate hijackings of aircraft on the morning of 9-11. What Norman Mineta observed was a young officer coming repeatedly to the vice president saying, it's 70 miles away, sir. It's 60 miles away, sir. It's 40 miles away, sir. It's 30 miles away, sir. Do the orders still stand? And Dick Cheney, he reported, turned around, nearly snapped off the officer's head and said, well, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard otherwise? And I'm convinced that the orders the young officer was so concerned about were orders not to shoot down the plane as it approached the Pentagon not to shoot down the plane as it approached the Pentagon. I'm telling you, the evidence is there, and the evidence is powerful, and the message that it sends is, ought to be chilling to every American citizen. Thank you. I promised you a film clip. I'm not gonna deny you that film clip. Here it comes.
Jenny Carr was attending a business meeting on the 36th floor of One Liberty Plaza, across the street from the World Trade Center, and caught the entire first attack on tape. A second explosion could be heard nine seconds after the crash. The windows in the lobby of the North Tower were blown out, and marble panels were blown off of the walls. This was brushed off as an explosion from a raging fireball that went barreling down the elevator shafts. However, there is no soot, no fire, no fuel residue. Instead, the entire lobby is coated with a fine dust, which is the signature of high explosives. Mike Pecoraro was working in the sixth sub-basement of the North Tower when the first plane struck. Mike and his friend ascended to the sea level, and when they arrived, they found that the machine shop was gone. There was nothing there but rubble. We're talking about a 50-ton hydraulic press. Gone. They saw a perfect line of smoke streaming through the air. You could stand here, and two inches over you couldn't breathe. The two made their way to the parking garage, but found that that, too, was gone. There were no walls, there was rubble on the floor, and you couldn't see anything. They went up two more levels to the building's lobby. As they reached the B level, they were astonished to see a steel and concrete fire door that weighed about 300 pounds, wrinkled up like a piece of aluminum foil on the floor. The whole lobby was soot and black, elevator doors were missing, the marble was missing off of some of the walls, the west windows were all gone, broken glass everywhere, the revolving doors were all broken, and their glass was gone. Every sprinkler head was going off. Could an explosion 90 floors above cause uniform damage to the lobby and sub-basements of the North Tower? But don't take their word for it, ask the Fire Department of New York. First, we have this interview from the Naudé Brothers documentary on 9-11. It was like posting in the woods and there was nobody in. Well, fuck, what do we do? We made it outside, we made it about a block. We made it at least two blocks and we started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Dead, yeah, you know, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. I was watching ran. it and running. It just ran up west. And then you just saw the, this cloud of shit chasing you down. You couldn't just outrun it. Just ran up west. You couldn't outrun it. In these interviews, Numerous firefighters from Ladder 7 describe a loud explosion preceding the collapses, not to mention extensive damage to the lobby of the North Tower. I heard a loud boom. And my first thing, I was, I was right at the desk there on the left-hand side when you come into Tower 1. And I walked out, you know, I didn't go out. I walked to where all the, the doorway was, the glass were broken, and I looked out. And I, I seen in the building across the street, I seen the shadow coming, like the, I seen just the shadow in the building across the street coming down. And with I wasn't expecting to see the damage that I saw in the lobby and, and the people, the bodies, the, pe the burnt people, the injured people. I really wasn't prepared for that. The lobby that. is about six stories high, and the lobby looked as though a bomb had exploded there. It's, uh, all the glass was taken out. There were 10 foot by 10 foot. Uh, marble panels that were once walls, uh, uh, they were loose from the, from the wall of the trade center. I went around by the freight elevator and I could see it was just blown. It was just a, a giant... 30th floor, we hear another explosion. And at that time we heard a huge explosion. Firefighter Louis Caccioli told People Weekly on September 24th, I was taking firefighters up in the elevator to the 24th floor to get in position to evacuate workers. On the last trip up, a bomb went off. We think there were bombs set in the building. Then in the radio transmissions from September 11th, firefighters reported numerous additional explosions going off within the buildings. See, I got uh, an eyewitness who said there was an explosion on floor 7 to 8. ago, uh, I spoke to the chief of safety for the New York City Fire Department. He received word of the possibility of a secondary device, that is another bomb going off, 
but he said that there was another explosion which took place. And then an hour after the first hit here, uh, there was another explosion that took place. He thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. Uh, we are continuing to hear explosions here downtown. And what we've been... Chief Palmer had reached the fire on the 78th floor of the South Tower and devised a plan to put it out. If the 78th floor was a raging inferno like the government would have us believe, then Palmer wouldn't have gotten as far as he did, and certainly wouldn't have been able to put it out. Kevin Ryan, an employee at Underwriters Laboratories, the company that certified the steel components that were used in the World Trade Center, sent a letter to Frank Gale of the National Institute of Standards and Technology, arguing that the steel used in the World Trade Center met all the standards for resistance against a fire. We know that the steel components were certified to ASTM E11-9. The time temperature curves from this standard require that samples to be exposed to temperatures around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit for several hours. And as we all agree, the steel applied met those specifications. Additionally, I think we can all agree that even unfireproof steel will not melt until reaching red-hot temperatures of nearly 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This story just does not add up. If steel from those buildings did soften or melt, I'm sure we can all agree that this was certainly not due to jet fuel fires of any kind, let alone the briefly burning fires in those towers. That fact should be of great concern to all Americans. Alternatively, the contention that this steel did fall at temperatures around 250 degrees Celsius suggests that the majority of deaths on September 11th were due to a safety-related feature. That suggestion should be of great concern to my company. The issue of the World Trade Center's collapse is at the crux of the story of September 11th. Ryan's statements directly contradict claims from the government and so-called experts stating that 2,000 degree heat inside the World Trade Center caused the towers to collapse. Days after writing this letter, Kevin Ryan was fired from his position the collapse of the World Trade Center was picked up by Columbia University's observatory in Palisades, New York, 21 miles north of the World Trade Center. The South Tower registered as a 2.1 earthquake. The North Tower registered as a 2.3 earthquake. Wan Young Kim told the American Free Press that their seismographs pick up underground explosions from a quarry 20 miles away. These blasts are caused by 80,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate and cause local earthquakes between magnitude 1 and 2. The 1993 truck bomb at the World Trade Center did not register because it was not coupled to the ground. And yet, on September 11th, both towers registered a magnitude 2 earthquake. In November 2001, Lerner Lamb said, During the collapse, most of the energy of the falling debris was absorbed by the towers and the neighboring structures, converting them into rubble and dust, or causing other damage, but not causing significant ground shaking. Mark Lois Yu, the president of Controlled Demolition Incorporated, told the American Free Press that in the basements of the World Trade Center, where 47 central support columns were connected to the bedrock, hot spots of literally molten steel were discovered more than a month after September 11th. These incredibly hot areas were found at the bottom of the elevator shafts of the main towers, down seven basement levels. The molten steel was found three, four, and five weeks later, when the rubble was being removed. He said that molten steel was also found at World Trade Center 7. The highest temperature was in the east corner of the South Tower, where a temperature of 1,377 degrees Fahrenheit was recorded. The molten steel in the basement was more than double that temperature. Do you still think that jet fuel brought down the World Trade Center? In all the videos of the collapses, explosions can be seen bursting from the buildings 20 to 30 stories below the demolition wave. Here. 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 And here. Etienne Sarre was filming her documentary, WTC The First 24 Hours, and caught both collapses on tape. Watch carefully.
tripod shakes exactly nine seconds before the tower begins collapsing, and a small piece of debris is knocked off at the right-hand side of the building. Not to mention this video of the second impact. An explosion is clearly seen bursting from the building more than 50 feet from the crash. You're probably asking, if there were bombs in the building, how would they get in there without anyone noticing? Ben Fountain, a financial analyst who worked in the World Trade Center, told People Magazine that in the weeks before 9-11, there were numerous unannounced and unusual drills where sections of both the Twin Towers and Building 7 were evacuated for security reasons. Scott Forbes, an employee that worked a fiduciary trust in the South Tower, told Victor Thorne of Wing TV that his company was given three weeks advance notice that New York's Port Authority would take out power in the South Tower from the 48th floor up. The reason given was that the Port Authority was performing a cabling upgrade to increase the WTC's computer bandwidth. Forbes stated that a power down had never been initiated prior to this occasion. As a result of having its electricity cut, the World Trade Center's security cameras were rendered inoperative, as were its ID systems and elevators to the upper floors. There were plenty of engineers going in and out of the World Trade Center who had free access throughout the building due to its security system being knocked out. Also, video cameras on top of the World Trade Center, which were used to feed daily images to local TV stations, were strangely inoperative on September 11th. Daria Kord, a guard in the North Tower, told Newsday that security detail was working 12-hour shifts for two weeks before 9-11. But on Thursday the 6th, bomb-sniffing dogs were abruptly removed from the building. So who authorized all this? President Bush's brother, Marvin, is a principal at Securicom, a company that provides security for United Airlines, Dulles International Airport, and from the early 1990s up to 9-11, the World Trade Center. If only we could examine the debris from the World Trade Center and figure out what happened. Unfortunately, most of it was immediately shipped out of the country to be melted down. Maybe we should ask Control Demolition Incorporated, who was responsible for cleaning up after both September 11th and the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. But I think the answer is simple enough. What happened on September 11th was a carefully planned controlled demolition. It was a psychological attack on the American people and it was pulled off with military precision. I'd like to add that there's been some uh, speculation that the planes might have been flown by remote control, which I have been unable to confirm, but I did learn today, coincidentally, that these planes have a flight maintenance system, which allows them to be pre-programmed programmed on a flight for automatic pilot involving GPS data which may make the whole question of whether they required remote control a moot issue because they could have been programmed to impact with the World Trade Center with the accuracy with which those planes hit the building. There's much more to be said about it, but at this point I want to invite your questions. Thank you again. Well, you're saying it's not hard to see what would be benefit the benefits of the Bush administration from from coordinating this. Yeah, because notice, it's very, uh, the situation is quite analogous to uh, uh, altering the x-ray, substituting a brain, recreating the Zapruder film. Uh, Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda couldn't have done anything like uh, pre-positioned explosives in the World Trade Center. They couldn't have, uh, they couldn't have arranged for an A3 Sky Warrior to impact the Pentagon. They couldn't have had a member of the Happy Hooligans shoot down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now, no, well, the question, uh, listen, uh, a lot of Americans don't realize how blatant the deception is. In fact, of the original 19 hijackers, of course, 15 were from Saudi Arabia. The number from Iraq was zero. And of those 15 from Saudi Arabia, seven or eight have been discovered alive and well and living in Saudi Arabia. But the FBI has not revised its list. I mean, it, it's so blatant. It's so in your face. It's so insulting. And I say, look, if a government can get away with assassinating a president of the United States in broad daylight in the middle of a major American city and, and, and fake the evidence to deceive it and keep, to keep a lid on it for more or less for 40 years, it, it emboldens these forces 
to take actions that they might never act if they felt they were going to be held accountable. That's one of the great ironies of this administration. This guy came into office saying he was going to restore dignity and integrity to the office of president, and he was going to be an accountability administration. No one in the Bush administration is held accountable. The only parties, the only members of the Bush administration at any level who have been fired have been whistleblowers who have been revealing the deceit and deception of the administration. Those are the people who bear the brunt of the wrath of George W. Bush, not, not the people who are, you know, doing their jobs, people who are, you know, rake, making the risks. Those are people he'll toss out on his tail, not people like the Secretary of Defense, uh, who authorized these torture techniques as exceptions to the Geneva Convention, or not his attorney general who redefines torture as though it's got a threat and serious bodily organs or even death. I mean, these things are atrocities, and they, they have cost the United States more of its national security than all of the terrorists in the world. In fact, they've multiplied the number of terrorists in the world many, many fold, hundred fold. What's going on in Fallujah with the use of white phosphorus is absolutely devastating. This is a horrible weapon. I became familiar with it as an, as a, as an artillery officer in the Marine Corps. And, and that the United States should be, that the Vice President of the United States should be leading a lobby to defeat an amendment that says that Americans will not treat prisoners in inhumane ways is about as disgusting as anything I've ever witnessed in my life. And I was born in 1940. And uh, I'm just saying, you know, I have been terribly concerned about the administration. They, 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 they gathered, uh, it, Keith Olbermann, some of you may watch his show, did a program, in, in Countdown, on MSNBC. In my opinion, it's one of the better programs on television. The guy's quite brilliant, and he's also quite witty, about the, the pattern of the Bush administration finding itself in some kind of political trouble and the incidence of terrorist alerts. And he laid out a pattern of 13 different instances in which within, within two to four days after the Bush administration find itself in dire straits, there was a terrorist alert of one kind or another. None of them ever amounted to anything, but they changed the subject and took the attention off of the Bush administration. Karl Rove has boasted how they create their own realities. And then while you are studying the reality they've created, they create yet another reality. Well, what I'm telling you, what I'm suggesting is, what he meant by that is, Deceit and deception on a massive scale, on a scale so massive that most Americans have difficulty opening their imaginations to the very possibility that the government of the United States could be perpetrating atrocities against the people of the United States to promote its own political agenda. But that, alas, is the direction in which all of the evidence points. Any other questions? Well, I hope those of you who came looking for wild speculations, you know, uh, aren't uh, disappointed here because, I mean, I tell you everything that I've said, I don't care how bizarre you might have thought before you came in here, but it's all provable. In fact, the whole effort I have expended in studying uh, JFK and now 9-11, as well as Paul Wellstone, but JFK and 9-11 especially, is take rumor, speculation, and politics out of these cases and try to place them on an objective and scientific foundation. And once you do that, you find actually the evidence is pretty clear. Please, identify yourself and ask your question. My name's Carl Wyant. My question is, can you talk, uh, my question uh, has to do with the amount of payoffs that the victims of the uh, dead in the towers have received. Specifically, can you talk about any clauses in, that they had to sign to preventing them from further discussing these issues? Yeah, I'm not an expert on that, uh, but you know, th there's a fair amount out there, uh, and it, it does appear to me to be the case that this huge, you know, this was a huge uh, buy-off uh, scheme. Uh, you know, a few uh, members of the families of the survivors of 9/11 have exerted tremendous political impact. I mean, just look at it this way. You had this catastrophe, right? If it's the way the government says, it was a huge violation of American security at every possible level. If you were the security president, as this guy advertised himself, then first and foremost, you'd have to get to the bottom of what happened, what went wrong. He has, in fact, and his vice president with him, consistently opposed any effort to get to the bottom of what actually happened on 9-11. They have opposed it. They've stonewalled it. The only way in which they were actually brought to even form a 9-11 commission was by the massive political clout being expended by these widows and families of victims of 9-11 who were putting them in the embarrassing position that if they didn't do something about it, they were going to be humiliated politically. Uh, Dick Cheney and George Bush went together to testify before the 9-11 Commission. They would not even testify under oath. I'm telling you that, that the efforts which are continuing in the Senate today, I mean, Harry Reid brought the Senate to a halt 
because the Senate Intelligence Committee run by this guy Roberts out of Kansas uh, didn't want to pursue the question of how the administration had utilized this, uh, this uh, phony intelligence about 9-11 in order to induce the country to go to war. We know there were no weapons of mass destruction. We know there was no collusion between Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden. We know that Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. And yet administration member after administration member, you can go from the top to the bottom, was repeating over and over the phrase Saddam Hussein and the phrase 9-11 over and over in everything they were saying, everything they were saying. And Condoleezza Rice, of course, was talking about a smoking gun that might be a mushroom cloud. I'm telling you, this is despicable. They knew what they were doing. This was coordinated. I mean, this was their policy. This is a machine that is ruthless and effective in putting out a standard message. They do it over and over and over again. And that just happens to be, when it comes to propaganda and you're promulgating lies, one more form of conspiracy. And it's not, it's not wild-eyed and it's not lunatic to recognize it for what it is. We have an administration that is at war with the people of the United States, and the sooner we recognize it, the better. Question. Could you uh, comment on the motivation for the destruction of Tower 7? Well, that's a very interesting question, why Tower 7 was taken down. There's some surmise that Tower 7 may have been the command and control center for the entire operation in New York. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, who was situated there, said that they were warned that the Twin Towers were about to collapse and they had to really scamper to get out of the Trade Center, you know, while that was going on. There were put options against United and American Airlines, for example, that are forms of stock that are betting that their stock is going to drop. And there was a group, interestingly, of uh, five, six, or seven uh, Israeli art students who were discovered to be on the building, on the roof of a building uh, across the river in New Jersey who had, uh, had cameras and telescopes and who were photographing and drinking to celebrate the event as it was taking place. This is all quite shocking. Now, I'm not implying thereby that the Israelis were involved, but the Israel has the best intelligence service in the world, which everyone acknowledges, and it suggests to me that they knew that this was coming down. Yes. And, and by the way, the administration, of course, was warned by many different nations that there was going to be a big strike. You know, uh, something like this was going to happen. Israel warned them, uh, France, uh, Russia, I mean, just around the clock, the in intelligence services were warning and, and everyone was disregarding it. You know, a guy this name uh, sh um, involved, the Democrat involved in the impeachment of Bill Clinton from uh, Chicago had news, he had information that the Twin Towers were going to be hit by aircraft on 9-11 and he tried repeatedly over a period of weeks to get it to John Ashcroft who was never available to take this information from David Sh Shippers who was, you know, certainly not any, uh, any uh, adversary of Republican administrations having led the impeachment against Bill Clinton.